today's video, we're going to be reading The Lion King, the book, the film, to try and help you get to sleep. Chapter 1. In the moments before the sun rose over the horizon, the African plain was hushed. No birds sang, no animals called. The only sounds were the soft whisper of the breeze as it blew through the long grasses, still green in the early spring, and this distant thunder of water cascading over Victoria Falls into the frosty pools below. But as the sunlight began to break over the savannah, life began to stir. It was slow at first, barely noticeable, a soft mew rising from the meerkat den, a rustle of feathers as the mabau stalks lifted their long black wings and stretched their necks. Then faster and faster the sounds grew louder, merging into the song of the savannah. Cheetah mothers coaxed their young into the sunlight with gentle nudges into their cob sides and quick licks to say hello. A pair of toad bees tapped their horns in the greeting and then turned towards the grasslands, eager for their first meal of the day. Their brown bodies, marked with swaths of black, gleamed in the sun as it rose higher and higher. Over the open plains, a herd of elephants began to march toward the watering hole, their long trunks swinging, the pads at their feet leaving deep impressions in the ground. Near the top of the hill, a mother giraffe appeared, her baby following close behind, its head wink swinging back and forth as it scanned the landscape for friends and predators. Below, on a plain still covered with a thin layer of morning mist, a herd of gazelles leapt and played, the young ones jumping over the brush with a band and then spooking as, it, as an even larger herd of zebras passed by. Even the smallest of life had awoken, while the tree branches ants began to march out their holes and headed to ground, careful to stay out of the way of hungry guinea fowl. Tiny birds flew from branch to branch, the boldest occasionally swooping down to catch a ride on a passing elephant. As all the animals of the savannah continued to wake, the sound grew to a crescendo until finally it broke with a loud trumpet from an elephant. But beneath the peace of a growing sense of excitement that every animal, from the largest to the smallest, felt, it was why, in almost perfect synchrony and complete harmony, they began to make their way to Pride Rock. The heart of their part of the savannah, Pride Rock, was where Mufasa, giant lion who had led the land for years and his pride of lions lived and this day he would introduce his kingdom to his son it was a tradition that had been upheld for generations Mufasa's family as well were expected he was fierce and mighty but he was kind and he treated everyone from the ants to the antelope as important in return, he had earned the respect of every animal and family in the Pride Lands, and now they would show their respects by greeting his new son. The sun had finally risen in the sky by the time all the animals arrived at Pride Rock. A hush fell over them as they raised their heads to look at the large rock jutting out over the savannah. It dominated the landscape casting those nearest in the shadow. For years it had been the symbol of their kingdom, a natural a natural amphitheatre and gathering place. In the wet season it provided shelter, and in the dry season it was refuge from the brutal sun. But most importantly, it was where Mufasa and his queen, Sabri, lived with their pride of lions. 
Now it was at this stage, and everyone was eager to show, for the show to begin. As they waited inside the cave, tucked in the back of Pride Rock, Mufasa looked down at his queen. Beside her, their young son, Simba, slept peacefully, unaware of what was in store. His light brown body was relaxed, his sides raising evenly as he breathed in and out. Lowering her head, Sabri gently nuzzled the young cub. Simba's eyes slowly opened at the coming, confronting sight of his mother and father. He let out a big yawn and then stretched. Mufasa smiled proudly, watching him. He had done many great things in his life, but the thing he was most proud of was this. His son, his queen. And the life he had created for them. Hearing footsteps, Mufasa turned and his grin grew wider. His old friend and conf confident Rafiki has arrived. Although the mandrel was a bit grizzled and bent, his eyes were still bright. He leaned on his wooden staff a little more than he once had, but his steps were still light. It had been Rafiki who introduced Mufasa to the kingdom when he was just a cub, and he would now do the same with Simba. Approaching each other, the two old friends exchanged a hug, and then Mufasa stepped aside. It was time for the ceremony to begin. Simba watched curiously as the monkey stepped in front of him. Seeing his wooden stick, the cub playfully tried to bat it at it, to bat at it missing and causing the adults around him to laugh. Rafiki nodded, pleased. It was a good sign for all of Pride Rock if Simba was curious and alert. Rising the stick above Simba, Rafiki shook it, causing red dirt to fall over the cub's head and making the young cub sneeze. Satisfied, Rafiki leaned down and carefully picked up Simba, cradling him in one arm. He turned and slowly began to make his way out of the cave. Behind him, Mufasa and Sabri followed, their bodies pressed close together. As they came out onto the rock, the sun went behind a cloud, as if it's not wanting to take away from their moment. Below, the animals leaned forward in anticipation. Step by step, Rafiki made his way toward the edge of Pride Rock, until at the last he stopped inches from the steep drop. As the gathered animals watched from below, Rafiki lifted Simba up, up, up until finally he had raised baby Simba for all to see. Instantly, the gathered animals erupted in noise. Elephants trumpeted, zebras stomped their feet, storks flapped their wings, and cheetahs let out their own cries. The sun burst through the clouds, beam of light falling right down on the head of Simba, the future king. The animals dropped their heads, bowing in respect. Simba, still hanging from Freaky's arms, looked down upon it all, unaware of the greatness of this moment. This was the way of life on Pride Rock. It was how it had always been and how it should always be. It was the circle of life. The way the savannah, through times of hardship and times of ease, the animals relied on one another in order to life to keep going. Now it was Simba's turn to join that circle. And while he didn't know it yet, someday it will be up to him to take his father's place and complete the circle. While nearly every animal in the savannah had come to greet their future king, there was someone missing. Someone whose presence, while not missed by others, was nearly was nearly felt by Mufasa. His brother, Scar, had missed the event. Staring at the spot that had been kept open for him, Mufasa sighed. Once again, his brother had disappointed him. 
he had hoped that just once Scar would step up, prove that he was above petty jealousy, but his hopes had been in vain. Scar had acted as he always had, bitter and resentful, angry to the core, as Mufaso followed Rufiki and Sabri back into the cave. His eyes waded down to the shadows beneath Pride Rock, where Scar made his home. Anger began to replace the disappointment. Yes, Scar had been born second. That was not Mufasa's fault. Yet, somehow, he became the villain in the story of Scar's life. Mufasa knew the younger lion blamed him for his lower position. Scar was foul and bitter lion content to slink about stirring discontent among the young lions and mocking and disrespecting his brother to every turn like he had done that day nodding his Majorne de Mo a hornbill named Zazu Mufasa signalled him over making sure not to bother Sabri or Simla, who was in the middle of a bath. Mufasa whispered in his direction to Zuzu, Go and tell Scar I am not pleased, he said, his deep voice commanding even in whisper. I'll be down shortly to hear what excuses he has this time. His orders given, he turned his attention back to his family. He wanted to spend a few more minutes enjoying them, not as king, but as father. Then he would go and talk to Scar, not as his brother, but as his king. Chapter 2 Inside his cave, Scar sat in the shadow. He could hear the muffled sounds of celebration drifting in from outside. The cave shook as the animals paraded around Pride Rock, trumpeting and roaring in excitement over the presentation of the beloved little Simba. Scar's eyes narrowed. He swiped a paw angrily at the ground in front of him. Was it too much to ask for them to just be a tad quieter? So much fuss for such a little tiny cup was disgusting, just like he is his big brother, mighty king, loved a good show. Trying to tune out the noise, Scar focused on a much more pressing task, his afternoon snack. Lowering himself onto a crouch, he shifted further back into the shadows and waited for the moment. Within moments, the cave grew eerily quiet, as though Scar had stopped breathing and moving altogether. Out on the savannah, the skill would have made him a mighty hunter, but the scar on his eye made him ineffectual to his father, so he had never been brought along on hunts. Never shown the way of a hunter, inside his cave, however, he was the mightiest of warriors. No one judged his weak appearance, his ribs always protruding no matter how much he ate, his mane mangy and thin, his coat molted and turning prematurely grey, his mismatched eyes, one bright, the other clouded and scarred. No, inside his cave, he was the king, and he was about to get a meal. A mouse, lulled into full sense of security by the quiet, scampered out into the centre of the cave. He lifted his nose to the air, and his whiskers twitched. His little eyes darting back and forth, convinced he was well and truly alone. He scurried forward, his nose pressed to the ground, as he searched for a crumb. Focused on his task, the little mouse didn't notice, as a shadow rose up on the cave wall behind him. Slowly Scar got on his feet. Hackles rising and his eyes narrowing as he fixed on his prey. This was his favourite part, the moment before he pounced, when he was steps ahead of his victim. 
Mufasa had always been the bra the brawnier of the two, but Scar, he was the brainier, and he loved a good game of cat and mouse. Inching forward, he was soundless, the pads of his giant's paws barely touching the cold, hard ground of the cave. He, when he almost on top of the mouse, he lifted one paw up. It hung in the air above the mouse for a second and then slammed down, trapping the creature against the wall. A sneer of pleasure came over Scar's face. Behind his paw, he could feel the mouse frantically trying to escape, but there was nowhere to go. Lifting his paw, he brought his nose down right in front, frightened in front of the frightened creature. Life's not fair, is it, my little friend? He said. He was so close to the mouse that his breath made the small animal's fur move. While some of us are born to feast, others spend their lives in the dark, begging for scraps. The way I see it, you and I are exactly the same. As he lowered his head, still closer, silently laughing at the irony of comparing himself to a mouse. It was true, they were the same, they were both stuck in their situations, and while he may have been born into the proudest of families, Scar was seen no mightier than a mouse. Sighing, he went on, we both want to find a way out, lifting the mouse up by its tail. Scar let him squirm for a moment. He would never grow old of the pleasures gave him to make the weak suffer. And why should he? He was the weak one of his family. And, and look at what they did to him. Cast him aside. Treated him like dirt while they showered Mufasa with praise and attention. Scar would never be king. That much was given. Especially now that the little brat had been born. But it didn't mean he couldn't find the source of joy, even if it came from hurting creatures too small to fight back. With renewed focus, Scar opened his mouth and began to lower the mouse down. He was just about to snap his jaws shut when he heard flapping wings. A moment later, the unmistakable sound of Zuzu's voice echoed through the cave. The king approaches. The hornbill cried, This is not a drill. At that word, King, Scar's grip on the mouse loosened. It was just for a moment, but it was all the mouse needed. Jumping free from Scar and away from his open mouth, the mouse sprinted toward the small hole through which he came. <laughs> Before Scar could even let out a growl of frustration, his snack had disappeared. It's in place stood Zazu, sitting down. Scar eyed the narrow the near the Sitting down, Scar eyed the narrow, nervous bird. He hated Zazu almost as much as he despised Mufasa. The bird felt that just because he was Mufasa's trusted eyed aide, he could go anywhere and say anything. It was irritating, as was his habit of constantly being nervous and in a state of fear not not that anyone could touch the bird without punishment from the king. Feeling the lion's gaze on him, Suzu scanned the cave. His nose dipped and down at the look at the dirty surroundings. The matted thin bed in the corner and the remains of Scar's latest snack. Then he looked up at Scar. His Majesty has requested an audience, he announced. Upon his entrance, upon his entrance, you will raise. Scar ignored him, looking instead to the spot in the cave wall. The mouse had gone. Zazu, he said, dragging out the hornbill's name, managing to sound completely put off. You made me lose my lunch. Suzu did not seem concerned. You'll answer to Mufasa for missing the ceremony this morning. 
Instantly, Scar was on his feet. He began to move toward the bird, his head lowered and his lips pulled back in a snarl. His Azu thought he could just fly in and command him to bow and act sorry. He was a stupider bird than Scar had believed. He got closer. He licked his lips sulkily. Scar, Suzu said, beginning to back up. Don't look at me like that. Are you hungry, Suzu? Scar said, not stopping. Perhaps we could have a bite together. Hearing the hunger and hatred in Scar's voice, Suzu lifted off the floor of the cave. He could not wait for Musa Mufasa outside just as he, he could wait for He could wait for Mufasa outside just as easily as inside. But before he could turn and fly away, Scar lunged forward, blocking the entrance of the den. His body shut out the sunshine and cast an entrance shadow in <laughs> Suzu shivered. You can't eat me, he said, trying to keep his voice from shaking and, fall and failing. In answer, Scar snapped his jaws. With a squawk, Suzu lifted into the air, barely avoiding having his beak bitten in half. Below him, Scar snapped again and again, sadly sound echoing and bouncing off the walls of the den. Scar! Backlit by the sun. Mufasa filled the entire entrance to the den. His massive mane looked his massive mane looked the colour of fire. But his eyes were cold as they stared down the scar. Well, look who's come down to mingle with the commoners, Scar finally said, eyeing his brother, and Zazu was dis disdain. He lifted a paw and began to groom himself. Come here, out here, Mufasa ordered. He knew exactly what Scar was doing. He was trying to act as though he didn't have a care in the world. But Mufasa knew different. He knew Scar hadn't shown up because of one reason and one reason alone. Jealousy. Stepping back, he waited for the other line to follow him. Slowly, Scar slunk out into the sunshine. He squinted, unaccustomed to the bright light. He began to walk around Mufasa, checking to be sure the king hadn't brought anyone else along with him. But Mufasa was alone. Sabri and I didn't see you at the presentation of Simba, Mufasa finally said, lifted his head towards the top of Pride Rock, high above them. His body was relaxed, but his tone made his displeasure clear. His brother didn't look at Scar, instead just waiting to hear an excuse. Pausing in front of a large rock, Scar flicked out a long and sharp talon and began to run it over the hard surface. Sazu grimpsed at the painful noise, but Mufasa did not flinch. Was that today? Scar said. Must have slipped my mind. He shrugged. Of course, I meant no disrespect, His Majesty, or Supreme, as you know. I have a tremendous respect for the Queen. His voice trailed off, his omission blatant. Zuzu's head swiveled back and forth between the two brothers. It was never comfortable being in the same area as them. But now it was downright frightening. He could feel the rage practically boiling off Mufasa, and he could smell the indifference on Scar. Clearing his throat, the Hornbill took a step forward. As the king's brother, you should have been there in the first in line, he pointed out, voicing what Mufasa had obviously been thinking. Scar lifted an eyebrow, the moment pulling at his skull and making him look even meaner than usual. Was Suzu joking? Did he not just see the irony in what he'd said? 
I was first in line, he reminded him. Oh, don't you remember? That is until the precious prince arrived. Tired of their conversation, Scar turned to walk away. He had more important things to do than then be chastised by a bird and, and his bird tame bird brained brother. Like find his runaway lunch. Don't turn your back on me, Scar. At the sound of the master's voice, Scar reeled back around and he had enough. Oh no, Mufasa, he's not. Perhaps you shouldn't turn your back on me. Is that a challenge? Mufasa was lifting his head. He puffed out his chest and squared off against Scar. For a long, tense moment or two, his lion stood there, eyes locked, until finally Scar lowered his head and began to back away. He was small, but he was not foolish. There was no point in fighting. I wouldn't dream of challenging you, he said, and then added, again. Mufakas's heckles rose and growl began at the back of his throat. But before he could snap, Suzu flew in between them and them. A, wi a wise decision, he said to Scar. You are no match for his royal highness. Scar shrugged. Well, as far as, far as brains go, I've got a lion's share. But when it comes to brute and strength, I'm afraid my big brother will always rule. Not always, Mufasa said, correcting him. One day it will be my son who rules. Simba will be your king. Then long live the king, said Scar, turning his back towards his den. He slunk away, disappearing into the darkness. Watching him go, Mufasa let out a sigh. That was not how he wanted things to go. True, he had been angry that Scar had skipped the ceremony. But a piece of him, however small, had hoped that maybe there was been a, there had been a good reason. That perhaps with a new generation born, they could put aside their past. But clearly that was not going to happen. What am I... What am I going to do with him? Mufasa said. As he and Zuzu began to make their way back to the top of Pride Rock. Well, here's a thought, Suzu said, not hesitating to offer his dream solution. Why not drag him away with your massive teeth and claws? Mufasa tried not to laugh. It was no secret that the hornbill despised Scar. He wasn't sure if he was because of Suzu's loyalty to his king, or the fact that Scar was so messy. Suzu despised disorder. What? Suzu said. What? Suzu said. We both know he should have been expelled from the pride long ago. Mufasa's smile, smile faded. He's my brother, Suzu, he said, shaking his head. This is his home. As long as I'm king, that will never change. No matter how difficult Scar makes it for me, he said silently. And that's where we're going to leave it. Please let me know if you enjoyed this video and if you'd like me to do any more. I hope to make them a bit higher production next time. But I hope you have a beautiful sleep and I'll see you.